Right, Scott Hogg Stevenson and their influence on Scottish literature was, uh, was the topic that uh, I was asked to speak on. And when I sat down to write this paper uh, uh, a couple of days ago, I began with two questions. What is the influence of this great 19th century triumvirate on our country's literature? And why should we continue to read them and encourage new generations of readers to do so? And by the time I'd finished writing this, I realised that I hadn't actually answered either of these questions. <laughs> so I'm getting my excuses in early, and I apologise if you wanted clear, concise answers to them. But what those questions prompted in me was some further questions. And these are things that I think will probably come up over and over again in the course of today, and, uh, and, and I'm sure um, way beyond today as well. And they're questions in a way that we shouldn't have to be answering or asking at all, but... Here are some of the thoughts anyway. What is a literary canon? And in what way can or should such a thing be Scottish? Should we prioritise or give precedence to or positively discriminate in favour of Scottish writing? What does Scottish mean in the context of a country like Scotland with its complex and often competing social and political and cultural forces within its own geographical space as well as its relationships with other entities uh, beyond its borders, with England, with other, con other constituent parts of the UK, uh, with the other island of the British Isles, Ireland, with Europe, with North America, with other literature in English, with post-colonial literatures and so on. What does Scottish mean in all of these contexts? There are so many variants and variables when we start to think about definitions that it's tempting to say, why bother trying to define anything at all? I don't think that's good enough, and I'm sure you'll have gathered the ASLS doesn't think that's good enough. And one reason for reading Walter Scott and James Hogg and Robert Louis Stevenson and why they continue to be engaging and, uh, and important writers 120 years after the death of the youngest of them is because they allow us to explore these questions of identity and context and definition. But that's by no means the only reason for reading them. And indeed, if it were the only reason, it wouldn't be enough. So I'm going to talk about these writers and what I get from them. And perhaps that might help us on our way during the course of today. So let's take the biggest and perhaps the most problematic of the three first. Sir Walter Scott. Everybody knows that Scott is responsible for a false, romanticised view of her history and for creating a fake Tartanized national culture, and everybody knows that he is impossibly long winded and dull. <laughs> Correct? <laughs> well, my very strong impression is that these opinions of Scott are held overwhelmingly by people who have not read much or even any of his work. And this in itself is a good reason for reading him to see whether the reality conforms to the myth. So first of all, I think we have to ask what made Scott so incredibly popular throughout the 19th century and well into the 20th, not only in Scotland, of course, but throughout the world. And his principal achievement, it seems to me, first in his, rom in his epic romantic poems and then in his novels, was to make the past, that foreign country where they do things differently, accessible a place that his contemporaries could all visit. And Scott acted as their guide. As he showed them around, he tried to demonstrate how, despite their funny clothes and habits and their wars and their weird political setups and the wild nature of the societies in which they often lived, the people of the past were pretty much the same as modern people. What changed was not basic human nature, but the social, economic and political conditions which shaped their lives. And that's why Scott, despite being a, a conservative politically, was so enthusiastically taken up by the Hungarian Marxist critic George Lukács in the 1930s because he recognised that Scott was brilliant at analysing how human beings were affected by the social and economic conditions under which they lived. Now, Scott's views on this, on history, 
were formed by a mixture of his childhood exposure to oral history and storytelling in the Borders and his education in Edinburgh in the latter part of what we now call the Scottish Enlightenment. And he was a child of that age which prioritised the science of man, the study of humans and human society, which sought to explore the mysteries of who we are rather than speculate on the insoluble mystery of God. Or as the American novelist, the great American novelist John Dos Passos put it back in 1954, the professor was taking the place of the clergyman as the venerated figure in Scottish society. And you can see this fascination with human life on every page of Scott's work, whether it's in his poetry or his fiction or his history or his essays or reviews or his letters or in his own journal, which he wrote for the last six and a half years of his life. Here, for example, is the entry from the 1st of January, 1826, in his journal. People say that the whole human frame, in all its parts and divisions, is gradually in the act of decaying and renewing. What a curious timepiece it would be that could indicate to us the moment this gradual and insensible change had so completely taken place that no atom was left of the original person who had existed at a certain period, but there existed in his stead another person, having the same limbs and thews and sinews, the same face and lineaments, the same consciousness, a new ship built on an old plank, singular, to be at once another and the same. Scott was obsessively interested in the past, but not to the exclusion of the present or the future. In fact, I think you could say that he was obsessively interested in the passage of time and what that passage of time did to individuals and the wider communities to which they belonged. In the final chapter or postscript uh, to Waverley, his first novel, his massively successful groundbreaking novel, about the Jacobite Rising of 1745-76, which was published 200 years ago next year, he wrote the following. There is no European nation which, within the course of half a century or little more, has undergone so complete a change as this kingdom of Scotland. Actually, pretty debatable. I think he'd forgotten about the French Revolution, but never mind. <laughs> and then he goes on to talk about... Uh, uh, he says that the failure of the 1745 rising had led to the destruction of the Highland clan system and the wholesale reorganisation of the dispensing of just, dispense, dispensation of justice throughout Scotland. And this had been followed by commercial and scientific and agricultural innovations. In other words, he's talking about the whole progress and process of the Enlightenment. An increase in national and private wealth and the early stirrings of industrial revolution. But, Scott goes on, but the change, though steadily and rapidly progressive has nevertheless been gradual <coughs> and like those who drift down the stream of a deep and smooth river we are not aware of the progress we have made until we fix our eye on the now distant point from which we have been drifted i love that 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 metaphor for 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 the passage of time <coughs> steady and rapid progress which is at the same time gradual don't we all feel this? Is it really five years since so-and-so died or your sister got married and went to Australia? Is it possible that 15 years ago the vast majority, majority of us had neither internet access nor mobile phones? And the idea that you might be able to access your bank account or send a photo to your sister in Australia from your phone while sitting in a cafe in Barcelona, <coughs> well, you get the point I'm trying to make. Our simultaneous engagement with and alienation from progress is no different, really, from what Walter Scott was feeling and thinking and writing about. Now, as a tour guide into the past, Scott was best on the territory he knew best. He wrote best when he wrote about his own country, Scotland, and it's his Scottish novels that, in my view, have really lasted. The Scotland of his long poems and his first nine novels and then one or two a wee bit later, uh, was familiar to other Scots, yet Scott still somehow made it new 
and exciting, especially in the way he encouraged you, the reader, to travel across not only timelines, but fault lines of religion, war and culture, not least to travel across the Highland Line. Scott's sometimes accused of, um, in fact he was accused in his own lifetime of, of a, a Celtification of Scottish culture. But it's not really fair to blame Scott for, for that, even if it's blameworthy, um, because all he was doing was really building on the previous generation's infatuation with Ossian. Um, but what Scott was also doing there, I think, was making a serious attempt to knit together uh, the cultures of the Lowlands and the Highlands. And that was just for his Scottish readers. But for his non-Scottish readers, he presented in all its parts an exotic and largely unknown country. Did he create a romanticised view of it? Well, he lived in a romantic age, the romantic age. Um, but was he responsible for the way people responded to his novels? I'm not sure that you can say that he was. Books are a two-way process. I know this very much as a, as, a, as a writer. You write the book and then it goes out there and actually, so long as the book stays closed, it's, it's dead. It's when somebody opens it up then it, become, then it comes alive again and the reader contributes at least as much to the book as the writer does. And Scott's fiction is heavily laced with doses of irony if you look for them. He's not just writing some kind of uh, easy romantic version of, of Scotland or of, of, Scot of the Scottish history. He's actually often uh, poking fun and laughing at the romanticising of the past. His heroes like Edward Waverley are deliberately blank canvases so that Scott can have fun at their expense. He can make them fall for the romantic and then drag them back into sober reality and into the present after they've been thoroughly impressed upon in the course of their adventures. Uh, Waverley, he, fam he famously described Edward Waverley in a letter to a friend as a sneaking piece of imbecility. <laughs> and I kind of see Edward Waverley as an empty carriage into which the gentle reader steps at the start of the novel and from which he or she descends at the end. And the last laugh, possibly, <coughs> that Scott has is on his readers. And it's the same with the supposed heroes of some of his other novels, Rob Roy, The Antiquary, Guy Mannering, Red Gauntlet. Actually, these heroes, they are quite flat and two-dimensional in some ways, but they're not the main attraction. It's the characters they meet who are fas fascinating and memorable. Now, I don't have time today to go into the details of why Scott at his best is so good, but here are a couple of examples. If you're looking for a way of engaging your students in this coming referendum year, with the idea that the yes-no question of independence has been around for a long time, then hand out a sheet, and remember that Scott is out of copyright, so you can do this, <laughs> hand out a sheet with the following conversation from the novel Rob Roy. This is the section when the, the, the hero Frank Osbaldiston is riding into bandit country, uh, which we know today as the Trossachs, <laughs> in the company of his... Gurney manservant Andrew Fairservice and the Glasgow merchant Bailey Nicol Jarvie. Now it's just before the Jacobite Rising of 1715. And uh, as they ride, Jarvie, who is a unionist, and Fairservice, who is a nationalist, argue about the merits of the union, which had only taken place a, a few years before. And Frank, the young English hero, is narrating... Although, like my father, Mr. Jarvie considered commercial transactions the most important objects of human life, he was not wedded to them so as to undervalue more, so as to, uh, uh, undervalue more general knowledge. On the contrary, with much oddity and vulgarity of matter, Mr. Jarvie's conversation showed tokens of a shrewd, observing, liberal and a well-improved mind. He was a good local antiquary and entertained me as we passed along with an account of remarkable events which had formerly taken place in the scenes through which we passed. And as he was well acquainted with the, with the ancient history of his district, he saw with the prospective eye of an enlightened patriot the buds of many of those future advantages which have only blossomed and ripened within these few years. I remarked also and with great pleasure that although a keen Scotchman and abundantly zealous for the honour of his country, he was disposed to think liberally of the sister kingdom. When Andrew Fairservice, whom, by the way, the bailey could not abide, chose to impute the accident of one of the horses casting his shoe 
to the deteriorating influence of the union, he incurred a severe rebuke from Mr. Jarvie. Whisht, sir, whisht, that's ill scraped tongues like yours that mark mischief between neighbourhoods and nations. There's nothing so good on this side of time, but it might have been better. And that may be said of the union. Nain were keener against it than the Glasgow folk, with their rabblings and their risings and their mobs, as they call them nowadays. But it's an ill wind blows nobody good. I say let Glasgow flourish. Wilk is judiciously and elegantly putting round the toon's arms by way of byword. Now since St Mungo catched herons in the Clyde, what was ever like to gar us flourish like the sugar and tobacco trade? Will anybody tell me that and grumble at the treaty that opened us a road west of war yonder? Andrew Fairservice was far from acquiescing in these arguments of expedience and even ventured to enter a grumbling protest that it was an unca change to his Scotland's laws made in England, and that for his share he would not for all the head and barrels in Glasgow and all the tobacco casks to boot. He gain up the riding of the Scots Parliament, or sent to our croon and our sword and our sceptre and mons meg to be keep it by the English poke puddings in the Tower of London. <laughs> what would Sir William Wallace or old Davy Lindsay he said or the Union or them that made it? And there, in two paragraphs you encapsulate an argument for and against the union. As teachers used to say, perhaps they still do, discuss. <laughs> and I wish I could tell you more of the, of the fine scenes in a novel like The Antiquary. Uh, people often say that Scott's hard to get into. If you want to get into a Scott novel, read The Antiquary. Within about half a page, you're right in the middle of a very funny scene about trying to catch the coach to get to the ferry across the Forth. Um, uh, but in that novel, the lives of, of well-to-do gentlefolk are brilliantly contrasted with the hard lives of fisherfolk, with whom they nevertheless have a regular discourse. When the antiquary of the title, uh, the local laird, haggles over the price of fish, Maggie Mucklebacket chides him with the remark, it's no fish you're buying, it's men's lives. A warning which comes back to haunt them all in a tragic scene later in the novel. And nor do I have time here to remark on the remarkable modern relevance of a novel like The Heart of Midlothian, with its mass of rich and engaging characters, its two central, strong female characters, Jeannie and Effie Deans, the moral dilemmas they each face against the historical drama of a Scotland still, and this is 1736, at ease with the illities with the Union, and the amazing depiction of Edinburgh as a living, breathing character in its own right. Now it's true that Scott does sometimes drag and he sometimes is a wee bit too wordy, sometimes allows himself to go off on too long a diversion. And it's true that I never read a Scott novel till I was in my twenties, but that was largely because when I was in my teens, whenever anybody suggested that I read one, it was usually Ivanhoe or Woodstock or Kenilworth, which I think are much, much less interesting books than the Scottish series. And I gave up. Coincidentally, uh, somebody who's here today emailed me uh, yesterday, to, to, yesterday to say that they tried a couple of Scott novels this summer and they'd enjoyed Red Gauntlet, finding it surprisingly light and humorous. But I'd got a bit bogged down in Waverley and then found Scott admitting at the end of chapter five that the preceding chapters could be criticised for being a bit tedious and unnecessary. <laughs> And you get this all the time. Uh, Scott, Scott think, people think Scott's going to be terribly dull and he's not. He's very, very funny. Uh, he's, 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 he's an amazing, he's so full of life that, that he actually can see the funny side. He's always poking fun at, him, at himself. He's certainly challenging. But then lots of things are challenging and name the war for that. If you have students who can or do read, for example, Jane Austen, then remember that Scott is her contemporary. And there's no reason why they shouldn't try him too. Scott said of Jane Austen after reading Pride and Prejudice for at least the third time, that though he, though he could do the big bow-wow strain like any now going, she had the exquisite touch for describing the commonplace things of ordinary life which was denied him. True? I'm not so sure. Perhaps, though, that's a good way of introducing Scott to a good reader. Contrast and compare, as teachers also used to say, <laughs> and perhaps still do. <laughs> Did Scott create a fake, tartanised, Scottish national culture. Did he become dated? He certainly fell out of favour after the First World War for various reasons. He was notably a tough and a Tory in contrast to that much better loved 
democratic egalitarian Robert Burns. Again, these are myths and reputations that perhaps need to be revisited, explored and challenged. Hugh McDermott, who by the way is one of my great literary heroes and whose work plugged me into my country's culture in a way that my education singly failed to do, was caustically dismissive of Scott. He called the Waverley novels the great source of the paralysing ideology of defeatism in Scotland. But it suited McDermott, who in the 1920s and 30s had his own project for constructing a narrative of Scotland, just as Scott had in the early 1800s in different circumstances. It suited McDermott to attack Scott and Burns and Stevenson and nearly everybody else. I think now in the early 21st century we're in a good position for appreciating the wealth of our literature, including both Scott and McDermott, in a way that doesn't require us to take sides in quite the same way. Argue and discuss, yes, but this is partly why I'm standing in front of you this morning trying to persuade you that Scott and Hogg and Stevenson mattered because it's by teaching, uh, sorry, it's by reading and contextualising them that we and younger readers can discuss the big issues of life, which is surely, after all, what literature is about, if it's about anything at all. And another way into Scott is to ask students to look around them and identify how ubiquitous he is in our urban landscape and ask why. And I'm not just talking about Waverley Station or the Scott Monument or the newly restored Abbotsford. I'm talking about the innumerable pubs and hotels named after him or his characters or his novels or poems. I'm talking about the fact that almost every town of size and all of our biggest cities have their Scott zones. You just get a, a, a street atlas of any place and you will find them. In the Inch Estate in South Edinburgh, Shawlands here in Glasgow, uh, Motherwell, Paisley, Dundee, Aberdeen, Inverness. I just did a Google search and everywhere you look there are Ravenswood Crescents and Abbotsford Courts and this that next thing. The new towns like Livingston and Glenrothes, they're full of Scott zones uh, and even more recently built housing schemes since then. Anyway, I need to move on to uh, uh, the, the other two uh, characters I'm talking about today. So let me move on to uh, Scott's friend and almost exact contemporary, James Hogg. If Scott, to some extent, represents gentility and the establishment, Hogg represents peasant culture, folklore and oral tradition. When, Jim, when James Kelman talks of a Scottish tradition to which he feels he belongs, it's James Hogg that he always cites. Hogg, the illiterate peasant who taught himself to read and write in order to make his voice heard, who had plenty to say, but who struggled all of his life to say it. Now we think of Hogg today primarily as the author of the private memoirs and confessions of a justified sinner, but when that novel was published anonymously in 1824, it was a commercial failure and, and appeared, it appeared in a couple of Bowdlerized versions <coughs> later on in the 19th century, and then it was kind of largely forgotten until uh, writers and critics began to, to reread it and to, and to realize, people like Andre Gide, for example, um, began to ri raise it out of obscurity uh, with their critical acclaim. It's a novel that, rather like John Galt's novel, Ring and Gillers, which was published the previous year and was also a commercial flop. It's a novel that, in terms of theme and construction and execution, I think is about 100 years ahead of its time. What on earth were these Scottish novelists on at this period? You've got Galt and Hogg, and even in the same year uh, as, uh, as uh, The Justified Sinner is published, you've got Walter Scott publishing his, publishing his most unconventionally constructed novel, Red Gauntlet. Um, so there's something going on in the 1820s, which is very interesting. And Hogg's Justified Sinner is set in the 17th century, written by a writer formed in the late 18th century, published in the 19th century, and finally recognised as a work of enormous power in the 20th century. So there's an awful lot of territory and time covered uh, by the story of that novel. Now, of the three writers I'm talking about today, all of whom wrote huge amounts, the works of Hogg are those I know least well. But I think it's fair to say that he is uneven, erratic, alternately sure-footed and slipshod. He's sometimes brilliant and he's sometimes a wee bit dull. He's a naive writer 
with a heightened sense of his own naivety and he was well capable of playing the peasant to the gallery of polite society. He stands at a door that opens back into an older superstitious and fantastical oral culture and forward into a working class literature steeped in realism and averse to pretension. And the best way into Hogg may not be through the justified sinner initially or through the other big novels, The Three Perils of Man and The Three Perils of Woman, but through some of his short stories and sketches. And I'm really just quoting from now from the ones that really sort of made me realise what a great writer he was. He wrote an article in Blackwood's magazine on storms um, and how shepherds and their sheep, which is his occupation, did or didn't survive them. And, or there's this wonderful story, that the brownie of the black hags, which effortlessly combines local anecdote and, and rural philosophy with a disturbing tale of murder, cruelty and possibly supernatural intervention. Um, so there are, there are different ways of getting into Hogg than through uh, the, the, the justified sinner. Hogg's at times fractious relationship with Scott is also fascinating. Hogg clearly saw himself at times as the heir to Robert Burns and expected the financial and moral support of Scott and others in that role. Whereas literary Edinburgh saw him as the Ettrick Shepherd and often parodied and laughed at him in that character. And again, he was often happy to inhabit that character. But all of this leads to, inevitably, his masterpiece, The Justified Sinner. And it's this text that assures Hogg of his place in our literature. Now, I've read this novel five or six times, and each time I begin it, it's with the firm intention of finally nailing it down and understanding it. <laughs> and each time I fail, it's in the nature and design of the book that I should do so. And it is this that draws a restless reader back to it again and again. In this respect, it's a stunning piece of postmodernism. Nothing is certain, nothing is authoritative, nothing is fixed or fully explained. The editor's introduction and epilogue are contradicted by or, or contradict the memoir of the sinner and vice versa. And within the narrative of the memoir, there are further inconsistencies and confusions. We're never quite sure who or what Gil Martin the sinner Robert Ringham's enigmatic companion is. Is he a devil, a warlock, a doppelganger, or just a figment of Robert's imagination? The novel can be read as a warning against the dangers of religious fanaticism. Um, or, or, or more, you can, yes, sorry, I've lost my place there. Or more specifically, an attack on the extreme antinomian variant of Calvinist theology. Uh, but perhaps more easily today, it can be read as a novel which simply questions why or whether we feel bound by moral or natural law at all. This reminds us too that it is Hogg's peasant origins, his self-education, his status <coughs> as an outsider that makes him such a subversive writer. And the religious background to the novel, I think, is likely to be the biggest stumbling block to any reader's engagement with the novel today, especially when deep familiarity with the Bible let alone with Scottish church history, have virtually disappeared in anyone under the age of 50. That doesn't make Hogg unreadable, however. In fact, the editor's narrative, which opens the story, gets off to a relatively easy, easy beginning, and it has a kind of gothic strangeness about it that I think young readers in 2013 may actually find pretty engaging. My feeling is that after reading 10 or 20 pages, if a reader is confused and finding the whole experience pretty weird, then Hogg's trick has once again paid off. The deeper you enter the territory, the more puzzling it becomes, so that by the time you reach the sinner's confessions, confessions, you're ready for an explanation which then doesn't come. And my sense is that this is probably best. It's probably best to let a new reader plunge in alone into this book and fill in the theological and historical background when or if they emerge later. Certainly this is what has led me back and back to the novel. And it's what made me write my own 21st century version of it in the Testament of Gideon Mack. And here I must issue a warning and some advice to you. Do not allow the students in your care to read the Testament of Gideon Mack, even though, or especially because it's one of the prose works on the list of Scottish texts selected for study <laughs> in English at National 5 level. This is a cutting from the Scottish Daily Express, <laughs> which was drawn to my attention.
Shakespeare could be banished from Scottish schools in favour of a controversial novel in which the devil carries out a sex attack on a Kirk minister. <laughs> it emerged yesterday. <laughs> Teachers, that's you, have raised have raised concerns that by making Scottish literature compulsory, the SNP government may be forcing them to dump classic English literature. <laughs> Among the works they are having to drop in favour of a Scottish work is the Shakespeare play Macbeth. One of the books on a list of five works of Scottish prose is The Testament of Gideon Mac by James Robertson. It includes a sexual assault scene in which Satan takes on the guise of a gay man and forces himself upon a troubled Church of Scotland minister. Good God. <laughs> I did actually see this coming uh, when, when the, the text was selected. I wondered if the folk in SQA uh, did. I'm sure they did. Um, Scottish Daily Mail has, has form on this, by the way. Uh, I, I went back and checked the records, and an editorial in 1611, <laughs> it demanded that Shakespeare's play Macbeth be banned because it dealt with regicide, witchcraft, and Satanism, and had bedroom scenes in which the Macbeths did not keep one foot on the floor. <laughs> And another scene in which a drunken porter discussed on lechery. <laughs> Seriously though, I, I, I return to this question of a Scottish tradition of literature. The point of literature is that it tells us about ourselves and about life. And it connects us to other times and other lives. It will, if we allow it, go on performing that function for a lifetime. Which is why your task of getting young people to engage with it is so important. And it will tell us different things at different times. I felt the need to revisit Hogg and the questions his novel poses. But in the context of a secular society which has largely lost touch with the very idea of faith, what happens to us if we can't believe in anything? If that great human asset, scepticism, becomes so powerful that it makes us unable to act with any certainty at all. A tradition does not flourish by being fixed and preserved. That's not a tradition, that's an artifact in a museum. A tradition thrives when it is broken, challenged, added to, discarded, renewed. And a Scottish tradition of literature is enriched not only by referencing itself, but by engagement with other literatures. This is not or should not be about one or the other. This is about opening doors that with luck will stay open long after the National Five exams have been forgotten and replaced by something else. <laughs> But I submit that the door that opens onto the literature of your own place, of your own community and culture, is one all young people should have the opportunity to go through. It certainly should not be barred and locked against them. From the subversive world of James Hogg, I move on 60 years to the less obviously subversive world of Robert Louis Stevenson. Stevenson had read both Scott and Hogg. It's no surprise that he had read Scott. You couldn't really be... A, a, a boy in late Victorian Scotland would not have read Scott, Scott. But it's interesting to know that he had read Hogg. There's a letter from uh, Stevenson from Samoa in 1891 where he mentions that he'd read The Justified Sinner about 10 years before in black pouring weather on Tweed's side and that it had haunted and puzzled him ever since. It was, he said, without doubt a real work of imagination, ponderated and achieved, I never read a book that went on the same road with the sinner. It is odd, though I may have heard the story told when a child, but it is odd that somewhat a similar idea exercised me for some time, and the sinner damped it out, though perhaps unconsciously it came again in a new form. And this would date Stevens's reading of Hogg's novel to about 1881. He published The Strange Case of Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde in 1886, and I think there's little doubt that it's this the new form of the sinner is, is it's to Jekyll and Hyde that he refers. He's also, Stevenson, a bridge between the worlds of Scotland, uh, the, world, the worlds of Hogg, which straddled the, the pre-modern and the age of romanticism, and the modern. Now, I've reread Jekyll and Hyde even more often than I've reread the, re -read the Justified Sinner. It's one of several Scottish texts, by his Peter Pan comes to mind, that have acquired such worldwide fame that they have become cliches or shorthand for syndromes or psychological states of one kind or another. Jekyll and Hyde is one of those books that everybody thinks they know and therefore don't need to read. One of the great re rewards of reading it is that for many it turns out not to be the, th the book that they thought they knew. Another merit is that it's very short. 
and its language is not too difficult for young readers. It's another possible way of entry into James Hogg's novel. Stevenson inherits from both Scott and Hogg, and then he breaks from them and makes his own art. He straddles not only the folk and literary worlds, but he also links the 18th and 19th centuries to the 20th. With his creed of hard work and honesty, courage and honour, he might have failed to find a place in a cynical, exhausted, sickened and broken post-1918 world. The world of modernism and competing brutal ideologies and psychology and revolution. And yet in many respects his work prefigures the key themes of dislocation, alienation and dissolution that mark much 20th century literature. Stevenson is subversive, but unlike Hogg, I think he is subtly subversive. What appears superficially simple in his work is often complex and disturbing under the surface. Jenny Calder, in her excellent life study, draws attention to his fiction from the South Seas. Look at the work he was producing in and about the South Pacific, in the ebb tide and the beach of Falasar. He was writing about morally and ambiguous situations and personalities, moral and political corruption, exploitation and degradation. In the South Seas, a man, a European man in particular, didn't need to transform himself into Mr Hyde to behave badly. The worst aspects of colonialism and racism were visited on the islands, yet in this environment a man might also behave well. The narrator of the beach of Falasar, Wiltshire, is far from flawless or heroic, and he isn't magically reformed or transformed in the course of the story, but that's the power of it. Wiltshire's language is, as Jenny Calder puts it, ambivalent, honest, but limited and true to Stevenson's experience of the Pacific. And I think he applied the same care and attention to much of his work, including his Scottish novels, Kidnapped, Kachina, The Master of Ballantree, and The Unfinished Weir of Hermiston. And uh, I'd like to say a wee bit more about Kidnapped in just a minute. I think I've just about got time to fit all this in. Um, critics over the years, notably F.R. Levis, but others as well, done their very best to rubbish or destroy both Scott and Stevenson. Um, Hogg seldom even crossed their line of vision. And it, sh it sh did their best to do this on various grounds, including that they were bad writers or imitative or two-dimensional or over-consciously stylish or mere entertainers or that their books were not for grown-ups. All of these criticisms may contain truths, but none of them is comprehensively true. And the ones about them being mere entertainers or writers for children always tickle me. How did such highbrows think, highbrows think that readers became readers in the first place? By being bored to death by books. <laughs> Stevenson has a very nice line when he says, books are good enough in their own way, but they're a mighty bloodless substitute for life. I don't think he was saying either or or. I don't think he was saying choose books or choose life. I think he was making a conscious connection between the two. Each informs the other, and this again is surely why we read and why we want our children to read. So, Kidnapped, uh, which along with that corrupting novel about the devil and the minister is on the list of Scottish texts for National Five study. Yes, it's an entertainment. Yes, it's an adventure story. But it's still accessible for young readers. And even with the general decline of knowledge of Scots vocabulary, the Scots is not hard to read. And all difficulties around that are solved if an edition with a good glossary is picked. But it's much more than a ripping yarn. It takes us, as Scott does in Rob Roy, on a journey into the past, into the highlands. But this time, the narrator is a fully fleshed out character, David Balfour. And the development of his relationship with Alan Breck Stewart is central to and runs concurrent with the high drama of the plot. And if you add to this the geographical spread of the novel, which encompasses so much of Scotland, the historical background which Stevenson illuminates through his fiction, the tensions between and the conjunctions of Gaelic and Scots cultures, the linguistic sophistication and complexity of the narrative, and I recommend the introduction to the Canongate edition by Barry Menikoff for an excellent discussion of the language of the book. There's no doubt in my mind that this is a really excellent choice of text for both pleasure and serious study. And this just gives me a very brief moment to plug, if you didn't already pick one up, these postcards out there in the lobby. There's a, 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 the 
Edinburgh Napier University and the Robert Louis Stevenson Club are running a competition. They ran a prototype competition last year, and it's a competition open to S4, S5, and S6 pupils to write a piece of creative writing stimulated by Stevenson's life or works. You've got ages and ages to, um, to, to advise your students about this. The closing date's not until Easter 2014, and more information is on uh, the Robert Louis Stevenson website. So make sure you pick up those postcards before you go. It's a great opportunity to encourage your students to, uh, to do, do some creative writing. Just to knock on the head those slights against Stevenson's style, here's what the, uh, the, the, the writer Italo Calvino has to say about Stevenson, whose marvellous lightness he praises. I love Stevenson because he gives the impression he is flying. There are those who think Stevenson is a minor writer and those who see him as one of the great writers. I agree with the latter, says Calvino, because of the clean, light clarity of his style, but also because of the moral nucleus of all his narratives. Lightness of touch, gravity of moral nucleus, that's some combination. As I've already hinted, I reread Jekyll and Hyde every couple of years and I always take something new from it. In fact, I go back to Stevenson more than to any other writer, and not just his fiction, but his essays and his travel writing and his letters as well. And this, because, this is because, just as I'm being lulled by familiarity into knowing what he is telling me, he tells me something else. He does it in Jekyll and Hyde, and he does it in the South Sea stories. Uh, I, I read The Bottle Imp once every couple of years because it's so light of touch, and yet it contains such profundities. It's a folk tale, it's a fairy tale, but it's for adults and younger people at the same time. That is not easily created, nor is it to be sneered at. We're back in James Hogg territory again. So let me finish where I started. There's another reason why these writers have often been sneered at, and it is that the critics who sneered at them were coming from a different place. They saw, and some still see, literature from Scotland as an appendage or footnote to something else. English literature. Once you recognise the existence of a literature that bears the label Scottish, Scott, Hogg and Stevenson make sense in ways that they don't if considered as English literature. This is so obvious that I'm amazed I still need to say it. But again, to emphasise the point, it doesn't mean that they are only Scottish writers or that their work does not or cannot reach beyond Scotland. Our late and much lamented friend from Creative Scotland, Gavin Wallace, wrote in the introduction to the book he co-edited co -edited in 1993, the Scottish novel since the 70s, the days when a Sunday Times reviewer could applaud George Mackay Brown's Greenvoe as a novel in the great tradition of English social realism seems long distant. I wish I was quite as confident as Gavin was 20 years ago that those days are over. Nevertheless, the work of organisations like the ASLS and others, other organisations and individuals to create the critical and educational context that makes such a statement seem so dated and so silly has been heroic. The work is not finished, but what progress has been made. Scottish literature is now very firmly, as has already been indicated, taking its place on the international stage. Now, I'm not even going to list the contemporary Scottish writers who acknowledge Stevenson and Hogg as influences upon their own work. There are too many. The influence of Scott is less felt, or at least less recognised. But I think we're moving into a new phase. It was necessary, it was necessary the best part of a century ago for McDermott to do his work as the catfish biting the other torpid denizens of the aquarium, to be the volcano emitting a lot of smoke and rubbish, as well as fire. It was necessary for McDermott to assail the unassailable figures like Scott and Stevenson, and especially Burns, so that we could see them afresh and see beyond them to a whole Scottish literature. It was necessary for him to shout, not Burns, Dunbar, and not traditions, precedence. But in the aftermath, as the smoke clears, Scott, Hogg and Stevenson are still standing. Pick them up, examine them, read them, above all, enjoy them. And now, at last, again, we can begin. Thanks very much. <laughs>